Tonight, uh, we're delighted to welcome Marion Smith, RSA, who I note was elected as an associate RSA way back in 1998, uh, becoming a full ac academician in 2005. She was born in Fife, studied sculpture at Gray's School of Art in Aberdeen. Uh, her practice centers on creating site-specific commissions that embody a con considered understanding of their context, working in a wide range of media on a miniature and monumental scale. Marion works from two workshops at her farm studying in Fife, which is where she is just now, uh, a former cart shed for working on stone and a bothy where she works in a variety of different mediums. Um, Marion and I, uh, our paths have crossed over the years, um, first and foremost, uh, through my father, the late Fred Bush RSA, who um, uh, set up the a Scottish Sculpture Workshop in Lumsden, and Marion worked there for many years as a technician, and my father thought a huge amount of uh, Marion and her work. Um, I also noticed we both won the Latimer Award at the uh, RSA, uh, which is a award uh, at an early part of our careers, and we've both been the secretary, uh, Marion being the, the, the archetypal secretary for the, the Royal Scottish Academy up until uh, three years ago, uh, uh, two and a half years ago, and myself, the current one. So I am delighted and can't wait to uh, hear uh, Marion talk about a particularly uh, recent project uh, in Dundee, the Derby Street Commission. So uh, without further ado, I welcome Marion. Lovely. Thank you very much, Robbie. Um, so I'm going to share images on screen and ex explain some of the processes involved in making the works by showing you physical objects in my workshops. So the commission for Derby Street is for Dundee City Council and Hillcrest Housing Association. So I'm going to share my screen and show you a talk to begin with, you know, show you an illustrated talk to begin with. So this is John Gray, Dundee's public art officer on, on my first site visit in 2017 before construction work began. Uh, in the background ac across Strathmartin Road are the floodlights for Dens Road football pitch, just to give you an idea of where this is. The architects are collective in Glasgow. The development is predominantly new social housing. The reinstated Russell Street, now called Moorhead Street after the suffragette Ethel Moorhead is the location for the works. So in the centre of this image, you can see Russell Street and beside the name, some L shapes to the left hand side of the name. These are retaining walls for planters, which also serve as seating. And they were in the original plans drawn up by the architect and the landscape architect. I decided to integrate plinths square and plan into these. The client didn't want a big statement piece, but a series of works. It was important to consult members of the existing community about what they would like to see reflected in the works. I met with a group on a couple of occasions. I showed them images of historic maps charting the development of the area. And these images from the Bowbridge and Hillside works. And this didn't go down well at all. There was two reasons. The first one was about this image that's in the center here, which is actually, it's a little bronze plaque, which comes from the modern gateway above. Historically, it had the sculpture of the camel over the gateway. And then uh, it was taken away when they used bigger lorries and things to go in there. But the community group, they just hated it. I don't know if they thought that it was something that I was um, proposing, but they said, you can't have that it, because of the association of Dundee United supporters being called the Arabs. So it was just a non-starter. And uh, also my idea of using the mill architecture as a starting point was also poo-pooed because they felt it was kind of glorifying the mill owners because all of these buildings are extremely prestigious, you know, and 
And I suppose the thought was that it would we'd be celebrating the wealth of the owners and not the, the workers. So I developed this new group of ideas after going back to the drawing board, which were more acceptable to, to the group. Um, this is the site in June 2019, and at a site meeting then, those ideas were approved by the client for further development. But you can get an idea of the context. You see the floodlights in the background through the Harris fencing. This is in 2019, so pre-COVID with this security in place at that time. So I don't know if you remember, there was an idea in the top left of those four ideas. It came from a visit to DC Thompson's archives in Dundee. The names I used um, in the crossword, which you'll see developed later, they all came from characters from the Beano, because unlike the Dandian Topper, the Beano still exists and, and you know, it's evolved through the years. And the format of the sculpture using the crossword came out of the kind of prolific publishing of crossword puzzle books and word search books by DC Thompson, who are really massive publishers. This is um, another workspace of mine that I use the uh, cottage down the road where I do my um, clean work and work to do when uh, it's really cold. So, sorry, I'll go back there because in there I've got an um, elevation drawing for the crossword sculpture to help me lay it out and not get confused. And this is it uh, in my workshop. I'm using it to lay out the um, horizontal pieces of wood. This is just a uh, stock timber from a timber merchant, 70 by 70 planed redwood. And I bought a lot more than I needed because I, I needed to select uh, pieces that didn't have knots in them. So I was so let, you know, going through all the lengths and finding bits that suited the length of the words. On the back of this, there are knots and, and oddities on the undersides, but the, the face is all quite clean. So this is the work um, cast at Powder Hall Bronze. Um, I chose to use um, reverse lettering. The, the, the type on this is actually a stock thing that you can get from a supplier. Um, but I decided to, instead of the, the work giving everything away just as soon as you'd seen it, I, I decided to use the reverse lettering. So in a way it's a puzzle itself. And also the reverse type alludes to the printing process. I was gonna say that. And is this, what's this cast in, Marion? It's bronze. It's bronze. It's, it's, I've got some physical bits here to show you how they went about casting it because it's, uh, it's, it's very, the, the bronze foundry think about working in a completely different way. You know, I'm more of a, um, a carver and constructor. I don't really think like a modeler and caster. So, um, this is actually all hollow and it was cast in different pieces. Uh, so you can see um, bits that are bright metal and bits that have got Newton's colours on them. And that's where it's been welded together because it was, it was cast in different sections. And the other thing is that I just, I gave them the pattern as, a, as one piece and then they cut it. They, they phoned me up and asked me if they minded if they cut it up. And I said, yeah, just go ahead. But interestingly, when they cut it, they were very careful not to cut on any of the lines. So all the welds are not, you know, because I've made little boxes to, around all the letters. Anyway, moving on. Uh, this is the reverse of the work. I mean, I don't like to see the front and back of a sculpture because it should be in the round, but it is quite flat, this piece of work. But 
you see that it's got um, legs on the back of it. So that gives me four fixing points onto the plinth, so it's much more stable. Of course, part of the reason for making things flatter is uh, to do with money, you know, <laughs> making things uh, um, smaller, flatter um, helps with budget. So when, when I got the prices back for making these four works, I, I could only afford to make three of them because <clears throat> quite a lot of the work was subcontracted and actually it's not very enjoyable for me to sit at home and project manage somebody else making the work. So I like to do as much of the work myself as possible. So the idea that I ditched was the one in the bottom left, which is, um, it was to do with um, printing. So it's like a half a drum for printing. And I saw those drums at um, DC Thompson. Like, like a litho uh, print through, of newspapers that, that comics yeah. through, right? Yeah. yeah. So in the bottom, the bottom right idea is called um, the thread counter idea. So this is a thread counter. And uh, I saw them in the McManus Museum, you know, because I, I like doing lots of research. So I go to museums and archives and set up meetings to see things behind the scenes. This was not behind the scenes. This was just on public view. Not this one, but several of them because they were used in the linen industry in Dundee and the linen industry came before the jute the jute industry and there was, they made linen sails in Dundee. So this is my full scale plan drawing for the thread counter because unfortunately you don't just go to the foundry and go I want one of these big. You actually have to do the leg work. So <clears throat> I spent a lot of time working on the drawings and going backwards and forwards and talking to Kerry Hammond at the foundry about how we'd go around about making these works. I plan to use the imagery of the rigging from a ship <clears throat> integrated into the work, but um, the source material that I found in the Dundee City Archives for the, the kind of rigging I wanted to show, this is like the quality of the image, this is worked on to improve it. And it just wasn't strong enough. And also the weight of the line is the same all the way through to take as a starting point. So I decided not to use that. And I went back to some of the maps that I'd looked at earlier when I was talking to the community about the, the site and how it evolved. So this is a section which includes Russell Street, which is at the bottom center and the historical bow bridge works that I showed you earlier with all the camel um, imagery, that's up on, at the top of the, the image. So I redrew the map, um, retaining the mixture of different letter forms and the variety of marks. But actually the, the map, the historical map was only meant to be about A2 size. So when I blew it up, there's very, very little information. I used drafting film over the top of the map. And, and um, originally I thought I'd do it in small sections and then put them together digitally. But I actually did it as one, very carefully not to smudge because I was using Posca pens, which are very opaque mm. pens on top of it. This is um, making a pattern for the glass lens. To begin with, I was just going to have a hole. And part of the reason for using that um, thread counter image, uh, th thread counter format for the sculpture was the idea of um, children and adults being able to interact by looking through the holes, like looking through the square hole and looking through the round hole, so that they're interacting with the object. Um, I'd, I'd done some work in glass recently, making lots of drop, um, lots of glass drops, 
and um, I'd been working up north at Northlands Creative. So through that experience and kind of building confidence with them, I decided to, to make a glass lens. So I made two, so this is um, a technique called sledging. So I made that uh, former or te template, the wooden shape with the cutout, and then you pour, you, you um, make liquid plaster and pour it, and then, uh, and then move the former around the plaster until you get a, a good finish. I hadn't done it before, so it was interesting. I like doing things that I haven't done before. You know, I don't like um, making work the same all the time. I like to challenge myself. Did you wipe away the excess or does the excess... And then I... Yeah, there's quite a lot of... It's it's really... It's quite tricky because when you, you need to do it in several different stages. And when, and when you pour plaster onto plaster, it sucks the moisture out of the next layer. So when you're getting close to, I found when you got close to the finishing part of it, it was looking quite messy and it was quite difficult. But we got there eventually. And then I took that pattern up to Northlands Creative and I worked with um, Michael Bullen, the technical manager, and we made a couple of, molds like this to put, to put the glass in. So this, when this comes together, it's a bit like a flask. You see the side nearest us is open, like a bit like the neck from a hot water bottle. So this went into a kiln vertically with a funnel feeding down into there. And then the glass was solid. It was like ice cubes in the funnel. And then the kiln went on and with gravity, the, the glass melted into the mold over a long, long time. So then I came home again and because that took quite a long time. And then this is Michael showing me, we're, we're polishing and he's showing wow. me how to use this um, polishing machine on it. Up up there in, in Caithness, which was great. I, lo I love going up, I love um, traveling around and going different places and working with people who have you know, very specific expertise and, and learning new things. And and then off from this experience, I'll maybe piggyback on to doing something else because of something else I've seen in the workshops. Meanwhile, um, at Powder Hall, um, they made several patterns in wood of components of the giant thread counter. Because of the complexity of fitting all the pieces together, um, some, some are cast and some are constructed. I decided it was best to get Powder Hall to deal with all of this rather than to split the work. You know, I, I, I made the um, etched plate and the, um, the glass <clears throat> lens for this. Now, I didn't say that when, I didn't say that when I was talking about the etched plate that I worked with Stuart Duffin, RSA, on that. I've known Stuart for a long time. When I worked in Glasgow as um, workshop manager at Sculpture Studios, he was workshop manager at the Print Studios. So I met him way back then, and I actually did an etching evening class with him in, I don't know, a long, 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 long time ago. And I knew um, he, you know, knew so much about etching and I really wanted to work with them. And luckily that came together and I, I really enjoyed that experience. Um, so here are the cast and constructed elements coming together at Powder Hall. So I saw this is during COVID. So these are pictures that Kerry sent to me. So this was very exciting. I did go and uh, Kerry invited me to come and and um, approved the waxes before before they went to be cast in bronze. So there's the um, the etch plate, and and in this image, I I don't know if you can see that the the etch plate is a, a bit of a um, pinker tone than the parts of the sculpture around it, like extreme. extreme 
the particularly on the right hand side the the bronze is a bit warmer it's more yellow the the etched plate is um phosphor bronze and the the other eight elements are cast and they're silicon bronze so it's to do with there being more copper in the phosphor bronze but this is not obviously not completed so it'll be patinated and when it's patinated it will uh, bring all the different pieces together so it, so it looks uh, like you know it, it belongs together finally the polar bear on the top right um, these are images from the McManus Museum and Art Gallery in Dundee. Um, I wanted to make a work that related to Dundee's relationship to the Arctic. I already made a, a major, a major work for me to do with the Antarctic, to do with the discovery. But I knew about Dundee's historic links with the Arctic through whaling, but I didn't like the barbaric imagery of harpoons and blood and blubber but I came upon a story about a polar bear which had been brought to Dundee as a spectacle you know like for people to come and see like a like a show or a circus or something but it escaped it had been it was being carried around on the crate on the in a crate on the back of a cart and it fell off and broke open and the polar bear was loose in Dundee um, these are walrus I ivory Inuit carvings, which I used for reference because I, um, I wanted the bear to be simplified. It's not typical of me to make figurative work. And um, the client, um, I remembered the client had said that there was lots of primary schools in the, uh, in the local area and they wanted the works to appeal to children. So I had that in mind when I chose to do that. And also, I can do the work myself. I don't need to subcontract, which was very appealing to me because I just, I like getting on with work on my own. <laughs> well, with help from others. And this is actually the, this is from November 2019. That is actually the, when I started on, this project in earnest and I went up to Fife Glenrock in Old Meldrum in Aberdeenshire where I work a lot and they've been really really kind and helpful to me over the years and a lot of my work has developed from being there and <clears throat> seeing what can be done and um, just seeing lots of stone in their yard and what other people are doing. So that is the end of my um, illustrated talk um, but I thought it was good to to um, show you that background to the bits and pieces I have in my workshop that would make more sense of them so I think I'm going to switch to my phone which I'll use as a as a camera because I think it'll be easier in this context to do that. So I have to mute myself so we don't get feedback. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some of the pieces um, that I was talking about. So up here is my maquette for the crossword. And here is a section of the full scale um, pattern that I made with the foundry tie, which is just, it's uh, attached with little pins. Mm. So it's made of lead, I think, the foundry tie or something like that. So the, the foundry cut it up and that, they put the, a little bit of wax there. That's to do with the flow of the bronze into the, the mold. So, the, so they took this, piece of wooden pattern and then they made a, a rubber mold of it so there's the pink the pink stuff is the rubber mold and it is keyed into a plaster jacket to support it because that was a big thing with this that you know the wood looks nice and rigid and straight but rubber is flexible and then from the from the um, rubber 
you go into wax. So, you know, you wanted to keep the wax looking rigid and hard like the wood. And this has got, a, so this is the front of that mould and then here's the back of that mould there. The question just come in, Marion, by yeah. Robert. What size is the final crossword piece going to be? Is the... Well, it sits on a plinth that's 80 centimetres by 80 centimetres. And I think it might go diagonally across the plinth because it might look a bit oversized otherwise. Mm -hmm. So I can't tell you exact dimension because, you know, I'm working in the polar bear now. I've forgotten. <laughs> Um, this is, this is a, you know, I showed you the stabilizing legs on the back. So that is, that shows you, that's one of the legs. I made, I made one of them twice because it didn't fit terribly well. It's just slightly, the angle of it was slightly off, but I told Kerry about it. And then of course at the foundry, they can adjust things once they're in the wax or when they're in bronze, they can be ground and filed and things so you know it was quite good to tell them about that and then they were able to deal with that so i think that's all i'll show you to do yeah. with the crossword I, i've just got one quick question on this so when you when you're constructing this does the weight and balance of the piece change when it becomes bronze than you than you anticipate ever or do you and you have to re rejig how it's standing up or is that something that you can <laughs> Well, if you've got a model and it works, like yeah. this model, it's quite a rough wee, wee model. It's, see, that's it there. It's, it stands, it works. The, the actual sculpture, I don't know if I can show you that. If I show you that angle of the, the feet of the maquette, yeah. in the real work, it's, it's all hollow. So the so these little square feet, it's like a box. It's like it looks like a box metal, but it's that, not. That's, that's what I was asking because I wonder whether that sometimes changes the the the, the, the dynamic of the, the weight and balance. But it's to do, I guess, with the shapes how things are leaning. Yeah. Aren't they? yeah. So this so these are in the real thing. They've got bosses in them, threaded bosses, and then um, so a boss is like a solid piece of metal that's been drilled and threaded. And then threaded rod goes into that. So it doesn't have to be transported with long pins coming out of it. Okay, okay, great. Okay. So I'll now show you some the, the pieces from the the crop the, the um thread counter. So these are patterns that the foundry made in wood. And part of the thing was. So I didn't want to do half of them myself and, and then do half. I did think about doing the this piece, whoopsie, the, this myself and then giving it to them, but it was very, very complicated. So I, I got them to do that. And, and they actually did this so differently to how I would have done it because that is part of like a um, square frame and I would have made the whole frame but they just made one section of the frame like that and then they made this mold of it and then they made four of them and then they welded them together so they you know they just think in a different way to the way that i think about making things um so now i think we can go outside to see the polar bear will we <laughs> Head torch on. So the workshops are both close together, which is good. This workshop is uh, a lot colder than the other one. Do you, do you find you have to be in a particular mood with, to go into one or the other on any given day, or is it just whatever you have to do? Well, for a long, long time, I've just been working on the polar bear, so yeah. I've just been cold, I've just been cold all the time. So. I um I uh, just have to brace myself. I, I've got an electric waistcoat now, which works off um power bank. You know, oh, like oh, you get for yeah. charging phone. So that's quite good for working on this. Yeah, yeah. And I've got neoprene wellies. 
which I'm wearing just now, which are very warm. So this is um, the polar bear. It's getting there. I need to do a lot of work on the head and the ears. The ears are far too big. But I've mainly been working on the the mass of it. I'm, I've been really, you know, um, enjoying working on the big rounded shapes. It's an interesting thing to work on because it doesn't have any sharp lines. Everything in it roll, rolls. So um, that's been quite challenging not to create hard lines in it. It's been quite a cathartic experience doing something figurative and that is so soft and uh, organic. Has that been a... a yeah, a, it's yeah. been very, very different. It's been challenging. Uh, but can I've really it, enjoyed it. And it's been quite a, a good... A little bit closer so we can see the texture because the texture is marvellous. I don't know how close that is to the end now. Yeah, uh, keep getting shadows. This, yeah, this is getting quite close to the, fin the finish of it. So it, it looked whiter before when I was working on it and now I'm, I'm honing it. I want to have an eggshell type finish on it, not a polish. But because I've been honing it, it's brought out the darker tones in the granite. So this is quite a new space for me to work in this cart shed. Um, it, uh, <sighs> These big wooden shapes on the left hand side are to do with its past, kind of like not, not its historical use, it's kind of intermediate use, like maybe yeah. in the 60s, 70s, 80s, we used to tip um, grain in here and it didn't, you know, I put a concrete floor in here, but it used to have railway sleepers that ran across it and, right. um, and tractors and tra the trailers were tipped with grain into there, which fell, fell b between the wooden slats. And these boxes on the left-hand side, they contained a bucket elevator, which is webbing with, um, with metal buckets on it. And, it's, and it took the grain away. You know, it was tipped here and moved upstairs and then moved with augers to different buildings. I don't know if that makes sense to anybody, but <laughs> I, I, you know, it's just like the evolution of buildings changes, all use changes all the time. Well, it's like the, the old Lumsden Sculpture Workshop. It was a bakery, uh, and then it became a place where they made concrete, and then it became the Sculpture Workshop. Um, so it's, and that history was all. I remember that history when we, my father first looked at it was all was all laid out um, in the yard of all the different things that used to be in there. So. Yeah, I remember. I think there was a big fridge at the back of it, like a walk-in fridge. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Now this, I'm sure I'm kind of getting the gantry in frame here because I got a Gillis, a Sir William Gillis Members Award this year from the Academy to buy this portable gantry ah. to make me more self-sufficient. So here it is in situ. Mary had a much bigger gantry, which she could roll in and out of her studio, but mine um, is smaller. It was uh, recommended to me by a friend who is a letter cut cutter who uses it for installing headstones. But you can break this down into component parts so it's portable. So it's great. It's I'm much more, yeah. So will we go back into the workshop for some questions. Marion is back. Are you, are you? Are you unmuted, Marion? I'm getting warmed up now. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And um, well, we've had a few questions come in, so let me get them up. Um, so Joanne and Alan have asked, um, when will the whole thing be finished and installed? And what's the process? Well, interesting question, because with COVID, it's so difficult because deadlines evaporate because Nobody knows what's happening. <laughs> so the site, the construction site in Dundee, it's um, Robertson are the contractors and it's their biggest site in Scotland. And they, you know, I haven't been kept in the loop, but they had some difficulties with the volume of people working on site and health and safety. 
Um, and I think they, you know, in, they probably got more important things to think about or to worry about than their public art. Um, I think I think the project is way behind. I'm afraid, but I want to finish the poll. I want to finish soon. So the polar bear, I'm hoping to finish in a month's time when it's my birthday. Uh, are you going to have some kind of ceremony, but finishing ceremony? <laughs> <laughs> yes, a champagne uh, drinking ceremony. <laughs> um, what what surfaces is it going to be pl plinthed on? Yes, the so there's the the plinths are different materials because. Um, I want I wanted to have mid grey granite plants, but when I decided to do the polar bear, I felt that the contrast wasn't going to be strong enough between the bear, the the tone of the bear and the tone of the plinth. So I changed the tone of the polar bear plinth. So they're granite, and the granite is um, the finish is flame textured which means that it's not a sawn surface, it's um, you use um, oxyacetylene uh, torch. I don't do this, they do this at Fife Glenrock for me. You take that across the surface and it breaks off the, the top cut surface and makes it look more natural. But it's more forgiving um, for getting knocks and marks and things like that. Well, just following on from that, um, Robert has asked, can Marion talk a bit about how the polar bear moves from granite block to finished piece? And does she use power tools only or a mix of power tools and hand tools? So it's the kind of yeah. process. Well, I could show you a massive long slideshow of the evolution of the bear because for ages I took pictures of it practically every day. And actually an elevation, if you're trying to show pictures of the bear, it kind of looks good all the time because it, the profile of it um, is very bear-like. Uh, so to you know, showing the architect progress, and they kept going, "Oh yeah, it looks great, it looks great." And then I looked at the pictures myself, and they all look very similar. So to go back to the question, uh, you know, the the photograph that I showed you, my last photo was of the bear at Fife Glenrock when it was yeah. in one big block. Yeah. And then they cut some angles from it which made it, you know, took away a lot of the, the volume of the stone that I had to remo remove. But for a long time, the bear, the bear's uh, whole body and head were all the same width. So, so um, I had put, um, you know, I drew, so I started off with the side, the side elevation of it. I had photocopies, which I, uh, Co you know, I copied on with carbon paper. And then I um, used a, an angle grinder and cut lines into the granite with an angle grinder and then knocked them off with a um, point and then kept doing that. Then I have got pneumatic hammers. I use, I do use a lot of power tools. I have a compressor and I use a lot of power tools and I have, um, they're a bit like kind of, they're nice to handle. They're, they're kind of gun-like things, you know, they've got a trigger and um, just smooth off it with that. But laterally, I've been using carborundum, um, kind of like a heavy carborundum drum type thing, which is quite brutal to work with, but you don't get lines, you know, like the, the shapes all roll into each other. Yeah, yeah. So, so working with that makes a lot of dust. And then laterally, I'm, I'm now beginning to use um, polishing discs on a polishing machine, which is different from an angle grinder, like the weight of it is different, the way, the way that you hold it is different, and the disc rotates more slowly. I mean, I forgot to show you something. I forgot to show you. Can I get something? Of course, yeah, absolutely. Ah, <laughs> this, I forgot. I meant to bring this out to the the shed. Lovely. So un, unusually, I didn't show the client a maquette at the outset for approval. I showed them drawings, which has actually been much more useful for me because with the maquette or, or with this little model, 
I worked on it as at the same time as the stone. So it's much more useful for me to see what to see what I need to to see what I need to do, you yeah. know. Um, and so I do a little bit at a time. So at the moment, the bit that I'm working on is between the front legs. And I actually decided not to split between the legs, which I was going to do. I was going to split between the legs, but it makes them extremely vulnerable just because of the structure of the stone. Well, talking of the stone, um, Valerie has asked, where was the granite for the, uh, sourced? Have you, is mm. there any particular place that has a special type of granite? Yeah, well, I got it through Fife Glenrock, who are the dealers, and it's it's called silver white, and my stuff is Norwegian, but you do actually get different silver whites from all over the place. There was another stone that, you know, I, I said to them that I wanted the whitest stone that I could get. There was another stone that was American that I could have got, but um, Fife Glenrock were using the that stone for another job, so it was easier for them to source. Yeah, because I, I worked with a, a designer who um, who went to uh, Ilsa Craig to get the granite that they use for the, the pucks for um, curling. Yes, uh, I've and, used that as well. Yeah, I've and uh, well. stories the stories about how often they can mine that and all that stuff are, 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 are incredible. Anyway, it's it's the hardest granite for the for the, in the world for the for playing championship curling. I didn't know that before. Um, a couple of other questions. Um, John asked. Uh, question you've already answered but I just want to acknowledge uh, when was the work due to be installed um, um Fiona it, it, asked, was, it was originally last autumn but it just depends what's happening on site you know when I showed you the pictures on site the buildings were all complete well not completed but you can see buildings on the north north side of the site the street the Russell Street was supposed to be handed over with that first part of the job but it yeah. changes all the time yeah. because yeah. one of the big things is that those L-shaped planters, they, you know, that's the responsibility of the contractors and they don't want, they don't want anything to do with installing the sculpture. So that, they, I need to wait until the site is handed over, until the sculptures can go in. Yeah. And the last question I've got here, but you're very welcome, guys, to put some more in uh, from Fiona. She, this is back to the crossword. She uh, asks, what weight of child will the crossword support? Question mark, question mark, question mark. <laughs> uh, quite a lot of child because the, it's incredibly sturdy. And with those four legs for stability, which are all going to be, um, you know, you'll drill holes into the plinth and the, the pins, which will be at least six inches long, go down into the holes and they're glued in with, with re resin, you know, that, that go, sets like stone. It's not going anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and another one come in from Robert. Um, has the polar bear given you confidence, inspiration to tackle more figurative pieces in future? I'm not sure. I mean, it's it's really good to be using that workspace because I, you know, I invested a lot in setting it up and putting the concrete floor in and everything. But I mean, I had intended to work on the polar bear at Five Glenrock in Old Meltrum because when you're handling something that's heavy. <clears throat> It's so much easier in a space where they're doing that kind of thing all the time because it's like really easy for them. Whereas here, if I need to move something that's really heavy, you know, I need to get help and I need to borrow the forklift and I need to borrow, you know, I mean, it should be better now that I've got my gantry. But um, anyway, going to working on the polar bear has been a really good experience and I've got lots of bits of stone around and I, yeah, I would like to make more work, but whether I make figurative work, I'm not sure. If you're hearing grunts, it's my wee dog Stanley has just come into the room there. <laughs> Marion, um, I just want to ask you a couple of things. You talked uh, uh, during your talk very eloquently about the, the fact you like traveling to these different places, different mm. materials, working with different uh, types of uh, um, 
um, machinery and, ex and different experts and craftspeople. But you also talked about not wanting to be a project manager and, have, and doing a lot of it hands on and learning the process. How important is that dynamic going from working on your own to working with people in, that, I mean, in terms of you generating ideas for your work? Because um, I think sometimes I think your ideas come first, then you find solutions for them, or is it is it the other way around, or a bit of both? Well, sometimes when I'm doing public commissions, I find that you get quite a lot of information from the client about kind of like they say, I don't want, I don't want to tell you what I want you to make, but you could make something like this, or you could use these ideas and whatever, and then you go away and, and then sometimes, um, the sometimes I overthink the practicalities of making things. I think, oh, I can't do that because that's too risky or whatever. But I think that the things that I make that I, I find most successful are, are often things that, that involve a bit of risk. And, and, uh, and I need to get help by working with other professionals to be able to realize what I want to do. So for example, I recently made a piece for a distillery. There's quite a lot of subcontraction in that. But I made the glass drops with Northlands Creative and there was a lot of doubt from people about using glass drops. But the glass drops are, are solid and they're, they're formed from solid glass mm -hmm. and they're tempered. So there's not a lot of risk in them, but trying to convince some people that there was not risk involved in it and also trying to get people to um when i say people not the client the client was very confident about it but some other people weren't so confident about it but i, I made other pieces uh, earlier pieces like a piece i made for donaldson's college the national school for the deaf which is a, a suspended work and that you know, there's a lot of kind of, you know, ambition is not, ambition is not the word, but like doing something you haven't done before that you're not confident in. And, and I was very lucky to get some support from one of the architects in the, in the practice about, about uh, how it was integrated into the ceiling and how when you made the, the, um, the, the structure that was going to support the suspended elements, how you got the holes in the right place to position it. And they helped, well, they took, they suggested to me, instead of having a specific hole, you have like an elongated hole so that you can twist the thing around. So you don't have to have a specific, you know, it's got more yeah. options. So definitely working with other people um, and, and ideas evolving. Um, so what so maybe to, uh, as a final question so when you when you get time outside of these commissions or interventions that you're working with other people when you're doing something much more personal for yourself um do all these things rub off or you or you is it, is it kind of a separate activity for you yeah actually this is something i forgot to talk about because <laughs> i've got some pieces here um i did i did i got some funding from one of these Visual Arts and Craft Makers Awards to do some pieces using, um, I wanted to use uh, analog and digital techniques to use lettering. And actually both, uh, both of the little test pieces I made have influenced the work that I um, did for Derby Street. So I'll just show you a couple of bits of pieces. Great. Yeah, we've got a couple more minutes, Marion. Yeah. That's great. So, I don't know if this text is in reverse when I show you that. Is it? No, it's the right way around. Oh, that's right. So this is this is the piece that I um, made using digital techniques. So I designed this in um, Illustrator, and uh, it doesn't maybe it doesn't look terribly creative. But one of the things that I learned about was kerning, which is how you move um, letter forms around. Because when you just put it in from the program it does not look right so you need to change it by eye and then I sent that this was done through powder hall because eventually the piece is made in bronze 
But that digital file went to a company who etched it in zinc. So that the red is like an enamel paint resist and then it's etched down. Now I had thought of using that technique for making the map for Derby Street, but it's totally inflexible. It's like you give your drawing and they do it, they, they etch it to three millimeters. And that might not have worked for that image. I wanted a lot more control over it. Yeah. The ideas for this, this piece is my own work from 2017. But the names of the boats are a byproduct of research for my commission for Anstruther, the Plough and the Reaper. I did lots of research at the Scottish Fisheries Museum and I collected these names from local boat builders. This is like amongst a list of about 60 boats. And then that is the work. That's the cast work, cast in bronze and patinated. And that was shown in an, probably the RIC annual in 2017. I remember it, yeah. I do remember it. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, Marion, um, we're just about coming to the end of our hour, but that has been extraordinary. And uh, I'm so glad all the technology worked, particularly when you went through to the to the, the shed, because uh, we got to see the the things in, in the flesh and uh, having, having you talked about them. Um, I'm sure I um, will be, uh, share everyone's views that that was a wonderful hour. Uh, uh, and again, our record audience, um, and uh, although we can't hear an applause, uh, because we're not we're not doing it traditional Zoom. I'm sure everyone would like to uh, send their thanks for your time, if not just the hour today, but the preparation. I know you've put an awful lot into it. So a big thank you, Marion. Thank you. I'm going to do applause for everyone. Thank everybody. you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Um, and great. can I just say a big thanks to Robbie for chairing tonight's event. And thanks again to everybody for coming and enjoy the rest of your evening.